Hello and welcome to lecture 6 of the forces unit in Phys 1104, and there are just a few last details to clean up with this unit. We've seen that forces arise from interactions between pairs of objects, and so as a result all forces exist in pairs, which we call interaction pairs. And because momentum is conserved so that the change of momentum of one object is always of the same magnitude and in the opposite direction as the change of momentum of the other object, we know that the two forces in an interaction pair always act in different directions and have the same magnitude. And what's more, you need to remember that those two forces act on different objects because the agent and target of these forces get reversed between one force and the other in the interaction pair. This is called Newton's third law of motion, and you can see it as a consequence of conservation of momentum, or alternatively you can see conservation of momentum as a consequence of Newton's third law. Let's now use Newton's third law to just draw a few more conclusions about interacting systems of objects. And in particular, let's look at a pair of objects that are interacting with each other, but where there's also some external interaction. So this will not be an isolated system. So here is a system of two carts. They're interacting magnetically, but one is also being pushed. And so the magnetic forces that they exert on each other are internal forces occurring within the system. But the force exerted on one cart by the hand is an external force coming from the environment. And we can think about a later time and how the carts have moved, and we're going to find that there's something rather interesting about how the center of mass of the system has moved. Let's look at the momentum of this system. We know it's not going to be conserved because there's an external force acting on the system. And so since it's not going to be conserved, let's look at its rate of change. Now we know that each of these rates of change of momentum is just a vector sum of forces. So dp1 by dt is the vector sum of all the forces on cart 1. And similarly, the other rate of change of momentum is, all, is the vector sum of all the forces on cart 2. There are some vertical forces here. There are the gravitational forces on both carts, and there are also the upward forces due to the track. But those are adding to zero, so let's just ignore them. All we need to worry about is the forces that the carts are exerting on each other and the force that the hand is exerting on the cart. And so, in particular, the vector sum of the forces on one is just that external force plus the force that two exerts on one. And the vector sum of the forces on two is just one force, just the force that one exerts on two. And so, there is our full change of momentum of the system, it is simply this sum of forces. But now notice something. These two forces are an interaction pair. So that tells us that the force that 2 exerts on 1 is just the negative of the force that 1 exerts on 2. And that means that the vector sum of these two forces is zero. And so our rate of change of the system momentum is just the one external force. Well, that shouldn't be all that surprising because we already knew that if a system has no external forces on it, in other words, if it's isolated, then its momentum is conserved. In other words, its rate of change of momentum is zero. So it's not all that surprising that the internal forces had to cancel each other out. Now to see how this influences the motion of the system overall, let's note that we know that the center of mass velocity can be found 
from the system momentum divided by the inertia of the system. Or in other words, the system momentum is just the system inertia times the velocity of the center of mass. So we can make that replacement in here and have that the time derivative of the system inertia times the center of mass velocity is just this external force. And the system inertia is a constant, so it can come out front. But the time derivative of the velocity of the center of mass is just the acceleration of the center of mass. And so what we've got is this. And this is a claim I made much earlier, which was that no matter where forces act on the system, they have the same effect on the acceleration of the center of mass of the system. The same argument that works for two objects and a single external force works for any number of objects with any number of external forces. We simply take the time derivative of the momentum, that gives us a sum of sums of forces, and because all the internal forces pair up as interaction pairs, they're guaranteed to add up to zero. And so we end up with simply the sum of the external forces and the rate of change of the system momentum is simply the same as the system mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. And this is why, as long as we don't care about rotation, we can always treat any object as though it was a point located as, at its center of mass, even if the object has parts on it that flop around or other complications like that. For example, if you were going to push a pillow, you can think of the pillow as consisting of a large, large number of interacting objects. We call them atoms. And although if you want to keep track of where the back edge of the squishy deformable pillow is, that might be rather complicated. Keeping track of where the center of mass is, is rather easy because it simply responds to the sum of all the external forces. I said in lecture 5 that I would talk about forces that depend on speed, and then I never did because I ran out of time. So let's talk about drag forces. Any object moving through a fluid experiences a drag force, and in everyday language fluid means a liquid, but to a physicist fluid means anything that flows, so generally a liquid or a gas. And drag is often referred to as air resistance. Drag opposes the relative motion of the object and the fluid. I'll explain that more in a moment. But at low relative speeds, we can generally ignore drag forces because they're small. Let's think about a falling Nerf ball and the direction of the drag force on it. It is falling down, and so relative to the air, which is presumably stationary, it's moving down, and so unsurprisingly the drag force, which is that contact force due to the air on the ball, is pointing up. But now let's think about a windmill to get a better idea of the relative velocity dependence of this direction. So the windmill itself is not moving, at least relative to the ground, but the air is moving in this picture, presumably to our left, which means you could say that the windmill relative to the air is moving to the right and the drag has to oppose that. And so the drag force will be to the left, which tells you that the force that the ground is exerting on the windmill needs to have a significant horizontal component, otherwise the windmill blows away or blows over. So we know that drag forces depend on relative speed. They also depend on the cross-sectional area. So for two objects, an object that is bigger will have a larger drag force at a given speed. It also depends on the density of fluid. So drag forces for things moving through water tend to be larger than drag forces for things moving through air. And finally, it depends in ways that are often rather difficult to calculate on the shape of the object. Some objects are more streamlined and that reduces the size of the drag force on them.
The formula you can use looks like this, and you can see the speed in green and the cross-sectional area in blue and the density of fluid in purple, and the coefficient, which is called the drag coefficient in orange, is something that encapsulates a whole bunch of information about the shape of the object and comes up with a number. Let's do a quick calculation to illustrate a couple of things about drag. So let's compare a baseball and a Nerf ball, and they've both been thrown straight down at 20 meters per second. And I've hypothesized a Nerf ball that's the same size as a baseball, and I actually have no idea what its inertia would be, but I looked up the density of polyurethane foam, and this is plausible for a Nerf ball. And the density of air you can look up, and they are both spheres, and the drag coefficient for a sphere is about 0.5. You can look that up too, although I'll warn you, drag coefficients are very complicated. They're, they even depend on speed. Anyway, we throw both balls down. This is what the free body diagram will look like. I'm guessing they'll accelerate down. I certainly believe that's true for the baseball. And because they're accelerating down, I've set my y-axis down. And so now I'll write my sum of y-components of forces. So I have my gravitational force, which I'm just going to write as mg. And then I have my drag force, which I'm going to write out. And that'll all equal ma. And so the acceleration is simply going to be g minus a big mess. If you plug in the various numbers for the baseball and the Nerf ball, one thing to notice is they both have exactly the same radius, drag coefficient, they're both moving through air, and they're both moving at the same speed. So the drag force is the same on both of them, and so you might wonder why you probably think correctly that the Nerf ball will be more affected by drag than the baseball. It isn't because the drag force on it is bigger, it's because its inertia is smaller, and also that means the gravitational force on it is smaller. So the drag force on the Nerf ball is larger compared to other things. So if you plug in those numbers, you'll find that for the baseball, the acceleration works out to about 6.63 meters per second squared which is already telling you at 20 meters per second for a baseball drag is quite considerable. That's not particularly close to g. But for the Nerf ball, the acceleration comes out negative 6.3 meters per second squared. And so if you throw this Nerf ball down at 20 meters per second, it will actually be slowing down after it leaves your hand. You've thrown it at over what we call its terminal velocity.